Good evening. Welcome to Progressive Soup. My name is David Stevenson. We have three guests scheduled. One of them is here, and two of them are on their way. So It's me, myself, and I. <laughs> exactly. We have Mike Tui, number one, Mike Tui, number two, and Mike Tui, number three. I'm going to move <laughs> through various seats at any given point of the show. <laughs> and you can speak for Marty Heiser and also for A.J. Johnson. Right. Marty Heiser, of course, you know Marty has a, a TV show on Comcast. Um, uh, he's a great guy. He's a, he, I respect him thoroughly as, as a good Christian man. He does a lot of good things, but politically he and I have um, some differences of opinion. I know he's gone abroad a few times and helped out different countries. I don't know too much about him personally, but yeah. He's done some terrific things. He, he I think lives he's gone to Honduras a couple times. And he, lives, other places. he lives a life. He lives a life of, a, of he lives a life that Jesus Christ talked about. So I, I full credit for that. Um, AJ Johnson is a member of the Newtown Anti Violence Coalition, um, which um, evolved out of the massacre in Newtown of the uh, the, the kids and the teachers. And uh, she's been on Marty's show. Marty's a good guy. Marty has people on his show that disagree with him about stuff, and he gives them he gives them a fair shake and carries on a good conversation. Marty and I have had some great conversations, very respectful conversations in both directions. If anything, I guess I'm probably the more aggressive of the two of us to um, you know to to push my point on Marty. And Marty's very very obliging and very reasonable guy, and I, I give him credit for being extremely open minded for a guy who comes from the opinion of a group that's not too open-minded. But he's a good guy, and uh, he'll be here. Um, so, oh, the show. Okay. We're going to talk about a um, couple cities. Um, city by the name of Boston. Yes, Dave? That mic is bad. Let's give him that mic. Okay. <laughs> Mics are bad. I thought I was good, but I'm bad. Well, uh, I don't know. I don't know how much of that the audience heard, but we're gonna go. We're gonna go catfishing. <laughs> uh, so where's the um, the plug? Uh, the plug in my jugger. Well, this plug is off of the other. Oh, okay. Yeah. Whatever okay. plug you have. Oh, okay. But, yeah. All right. Hold on. Bear with us, folks. Okay. Gotta love technical difficulties. Okay. The oh, magic. The magic of television. The magic of the magic of live television. So anyway, so um, is it live or is it Memorex? Yeah. We can say it's live, but it's not. <laughs> it's going to well, be on two days from today. Well, I'm today. alive. It'll be on two days from today. Okay. As far as I know. So I a couple of little cities, one by the name of Boston, and, and we're not talking about modern-day Boston. We're not talking about the, um, the, uh, the, the more modern Boston massacre where that, that crazy lunatic and his brother, crazy lunatic, um, blew, up some, blew up a lot of good people who were participating in the Boston Marathon. And how's that? Okay. It's um, Boston... 1773, prior to the American Revolution, um, the British um, the British soldiers and I guess we can call them police because they were they were the equivalent of, of police. They had uh, they had weaponry, and uh, they killed five people. Is it on? No, it's on. Okay, they killed five people. They murdered five people. We're not going to use the word murdered because I think uh, people that talk about Boston in those days and talk about the roots of the Revolutionary War will concur that. The British murdered people. Okay. Well, it's the kind of thing where it depends on whose perspective you look at. A lot has to do with perspective. Because to the British, the Americans were terrorists. To the Americans, the British were jackbooted thugs. Not exactly those words, but were imposing their will on them, and they didn't. They wanted to be free, which I agree with, but that's an entirely different story. So, it, again, it depends on whose side you're looking at. I guess the British probably still think we're part of the colonies. No. And I'm sure there are some people in the U.S. that would probably like us to be. I'll tell you, people really do hone in on everything British, especially royalty. The baby's born, and it's just a baby. I couldn't. I mean, granted, if, if she has a baby, great. I, to be perfectly blunt, I couldn't care less one way or the other. I mean, it, to me, it's one of those things where it's always like, oh, such and such a celebrity had a baby. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I mean, it's... It, I always look at it as any like celebrity news or royalty news or whatever. It unless it person and again I don't want to be self centered about it unless it personally affects my life. It doesn't really affect me. But, but there are some people that get so bent out of shape if like somebody divorces somebody or somebody has a baby or this or that or whatever. People really glom onto that crap, and I'll use the word crap loosely. 
But um, but yeah, the, the, the British royalty, they get a lot of a press in the United States. Um, they came to visit, and uh, they came to New York City, and they visited a few other places, and it was like, oh, the royal family is here. Well, I will say it's a, it's a big event to have the royal family come to the U.S. But, yeah, so. that's right. But so at any rate, so back to the, uh, back to the, the subject at hand. So we've got um, Boston, 1773. We've got a, uh, an event that's uh, referred to by history as uh, the Boston Massacre, where British soldiers uh, killed five citizens. And uh, point well taken that they were, they were, um, they were jackbooted thugs, relative, if you want to put it in modern terms. And to them, the patriots that stood up to them were, uh, were terrorists. It's essentially, I mean, it's, it's again not exactly the same thing, but it's essentially the same thing fighting style-wise. If you look at uh, the Iraqi insurgents mm-hmm. fighting against our military, yep. uh, the way we were fighting, uh, and we, I think we talked about this on our show, um, where the, uh, the British were fighting in a given line because that was how they were always trained. Yep. So you essentially had a firing line and they were like two or three deep sometimes, and they're playing drums and fifes and all kinds of other things. So they're announcing their presence as they're coming by, yeah. and the U.S. soldiers are f- basically farmers with pitchforks and guns and muskets and stuff. Guerrilla so warriors. We're, yeah, so we're in trees and different things just because so, we knew the terrain more than the British that were coming over on boats. I think the British used the old Roman style where the Romans brought in their columns of soldiers. Now, it worked really well when you only had spears as weapons. Obviously, when you've got uh, guns on both sides, that sort of swings the balance over. As long as the, the guns can aim properly, that swings the balance over to the, uh, to the guerrilla warriors because they can hide and they can pick off. They've got a lot easier opportunity to shoot somebody than they I, did throw, to throw a spear at them and, and do damage to them. I remember, I don't remember the exact quote, but it was something to the effect of the British soldiers were so... Uh, confused that they couldn't understand a where they were mm-hmm. and b they couldn't understand why they weren't fighting the way they were trained because again they had always been taught this is how war happens yeah this you fight this guy in a line and then you look at him straight in the face where we're coming at at them from this tower and this uh, field and what have you and again it wasn't their country anyway I mean we our, our, the Patriots were fighting for uh, for land and, and country and, and towns and, and, and family that were actually their, their family, mm-hmm. their towns, their country. The British soldiers, they were going to go home eventually after they served their time, and they did not have the motivation. So you've got uh, Boston in 1773, and you've got, um, I'll use Baltimore as an example in 2015. I mean, I can use a lot of cities and a lot of incidents where... Not that it never happened before, not that no citizen, no civilian has ever been murdered, killed, if you want to use that word, that's fine. No, uh, no U.S. citizen has been killed by, by uh, either soldiers or by, uh, by police. But now, with everybody having a camera and everybody can capture everything as it happens immediately, and immediately it's all over the, uh, the blogosphere and all over the universe, things are being captured on film. How is that different than it used to be? I think probably not at all. I think this has been going on all along. There's no way of knowing how many police homicides there have been because police departments are not required by law to keep statistics on police. There there are some departments from the research I've done that Mm -hmm. do keep fairly good statistics, but then there are some that just say, we don't have to worry about it. Okay, so it's sketchy at best. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it again depends where you are versus the uh, basically the honesty of a given police department. Because sometimes they're not going to print results yeah. that could af- at adversely damage them yeah. from a PR standpoint, from a uh, legal standpoint. Good point, legal and, and a PR standpoint. Because uh, regrettably, that's how a lot of people look at it. They don't look at it yeah. from a legality or a, oh my God, we just killed this guy. They look at it, oh my God, we just killed this guy. What are people going to think of us? Yeah, and who's going to sue us for, yeah. for, for, for wrongful death? <sighs> Hopefully people think of that before you kill the guy, but and, hindsight's and I, always twenty twenty. And I want And we're going to have Marty come in and join us pretty soon. And, and the, the question I'm going to pose to Marty is essentially this. Um, 
the media, and this is all the media, Fox, CNN, uh, not so much MSNBC, but the media in general, the mainstream media, all those outlets are referring to people that break into liquor stores and steal a packet of Colt 45, which of course is, which is psychologically attached in our mind's eye to certain groups of Americans, and uh, stealing televisions out of electronics store as they're referred to as thugs. And the question I'm going to pose to Marty when he arrives, and God willing, you'll be here soon. Um, but we're doing two shows, so we'll get him in here eventually. The question is, if folks that are stealing televisions and folks that are stealing a case of Colt 45 malt liquor are thugs, what do we call police officers when they murder individuals? That's I, the, I can call them something that you probably won't want me to tell, but... Is it something that this? <laughs> it's a couple four-letter words, a couple oh, five-letter okay. words. I mean, okay. Can we settle on thugs? Yeah. Okay. You mentioned you mentioned in the in the analogy to um, to the Boston Massacre, and the perception of the the colonists, the British were jackbooted thugs, or something to the equivalent. I think. Jack well, booted, I don't. I'm think, I don't think they used the term like jackbooted thugs. That at was the time, more, but that yeah. was more brought in during World War II with yeah. the Nazis with their with their with their boots and their in their heel toe step. That they used, but um, yeah, I, I think it's safe to say, and, and Marty will either concur or concur 100 percent, disagree 100 percent, or something in between about that premise, and we'll talk about that. But in the meantime, uh, my professional memories with some of the um, some of the incidents that have happened in America recently with um, with police police and uh, civilians. Bring oh, us, bring oh, us up to snuff. Yeah. You, know, you know these things better than I do. I mean. I was just bringing something up on my phone. Um, they yeah. actually did actually just charge them, uh, the officers, and they apparently uh, the attorney, uh, the state's attorney Mosby, charged sure. them with a range from uh, from one count of second degree murder to four counts of involuntary manslaughter. Okay. I don't know how it's exactly involuntary, but uh, to assault and misconduct in office. Yeah. The most severe charges are leveled against Officer Cesar R. Goodson Jr., mm-hmm. identified as the driver of the van, yep. who transported Gray to the hot, uh, to the station. Mm-hmm. These charges against uh, Goodson are second degree depraved uh, heart murder. Mm-hmm. Which I don't exactly know what the difference between depraved heart murder is, but which carries a maximum uh, penalty of thirty years in prison. So I mean it. Again, it's one of those things, like with the Trayvon Martin thing, and I think we talked about that on one of your shows, That's where true. you only have a core group of people that know what happened, and now one of them is dead. Mm-hmm. So you may have all the physical evidence, you may have all the forensic evidence, but it's hard to piece together the puzzle from when he was put in the van to when he was taken if you don't have right. a video or if you don't have somebody that... Like, if you had one of the officers step up and say... Yeah, um, Goodson or whoever it was didn't buckle him in or, or was driving horribly erratic or purposely did something, then you might have something more tangible. But, I mean, hopefully they can piece something together. But it's, it, I, I kind of see it as one of those things, like, like I said, with the Zimmerman, Trayvon Martin thing, where you're going to have a he said, he said kind of thing, where they're going to point the finger at uh, yeah. the guy who died, uh, Gray, and then the family or the state's going to point the finger at them, and it's going to confuse the jury, and then they're going to end up saying, well, we can't convict him if we don't know totally that something happened. It's very difficult in America to convict someone, yeah. and I think maybe rightfully so. And, uh, you know, we get frustrated when, uh, when someone kills a family member of ours and, and they get off. But um, America's built, American justice system is built on the premise that... Um, and I think I'm quoting Thomas Jefferson on this, and then the audience will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, something to the uh, to the tune of um, it's better for a hundred guilty people to go free than for one innocent person to be convicted. And regrettably, there have been too many cases of people being on either death row or being in prison for 20, 30 years for rape or Still whatever. Happens, yeah, and then. Oh, we just happened to find this one crucial piece of evidence that nobody yeah. thought to look at or was in a dusty closet. And so, yeah. regrettably, there are innocent people that have, I, for, I can't remember the guy's name uh, offhand. I could probably look it up at some point. But he was in prison for, I think, the better part of 35 years for like uh, raping a, a, 
a little, it was either a little boy or a little girl, mm -hmm. and they ended up finding out later that he didn't do it, and they let him go. Yeah. And I think he's suing uh, whatever state it is. For all the years he lost. Yeah. Because, I mean, if, at that point, even though you're now innocent, mm -hmm. you're still, your life is in tatters at that point. Because even if you go in when you're 18, you're going to come out at, say, 53. Yeah. So you're basically, you're, you're working... Uh, span at that point is say maybe yeah. 20 years roughly to, it, even if you're in good health so and then it's going to be even hard to, for somebody to say oh well what was your last job or where were you the last x number of years oh well i was wrongfully in prison and then you got to go through a whole spiel and uh, granted you may find somebody that's going to say oh yeah we'll hire you but it's going to be even like i said even if you're innocent it's going to be even harder to find a job and the history books are all written at that point yeah. you are you're identified people hear your name and they hear oh that's the guy that uh that did that because it's one of those things where they'll have big plastered things in the front page that say we caught him or we got this guy and then if yeah. there's uh, a retraction, just like any other story, it'll be buried in page like 18 in this little blurb that says, well, we regret to inform you that we actually didn't catch him and the, the killer's actually still at large or whatever. And yeah, people, people like to have uh, finality. I mean, uh, now, now people are going to be concerned that that guy's been out there for all those, oh, yeah. was it 35 years? Um, this, that the, the perpetrator's been out there. I mean, I can understand a family wanting finality. They want to know that they caught the guy. But, yeah. I mean. But unfortunately, you're right. Sometimes it's, it's the wrong guy, and it, it can ruin a life. And uh, that's why we, we try to, to err on the side of, um, of not finding people guilty. If there's a shred of doubt in the jury's mind that the person's guilty of the, char of the crime they're charged with, the jury's job is to, uh, to, to either... Um, either find not guilty or to uh, end up with a hung jury, as is, uh, was recently with the case of uh, someone that um, that's, um, apparently was the, uh, the uh, abductor and murderer of a, a kid named Itan Pates decades ago. And, uh, yeah, but, okay. So, well, there are times also where hmm. you'll have, like, a second-degree or first-degree murder charge. Yeah. And they, like a given prosecutor, will know that won't stick. Yeah. But they'll use that as leverage to say, okay, well, we'll drop the first or second degree murder charge if you'll take a manslaughter charge or if you'll take this charge. So then they can get them in prison. It won't be for 30 or 40 or 50 years. It yeah. may be for, say, 10 to 15 years, but they'll still get them off the streets. So they'll kind of use leverage, mm -hmm. which... Sometimes a family doesn't like because they actually want to get the guy totally off the street, which yeah. I can understand. But and a public defender who may not be the best qualified individual to uh, to represent them, but he's a public defender. He's he's free. Well, he's, there are, he's provided. There are some public defenders that will go to the mat for their their clients, yeah. and then there are some public defenders, like you said, mm -hmm. that they basically are thrown twenty cases in the matter of a couple of months. So they have to go through and the, the documents for all those cases, they have to go through and then try to find out, talk with the guy, talk with the woman. So it can be daunting, especially on the public defender. Marty, if you're out there, come on in. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm waiting for Marty to come in because I want to get him into the conversation. That's my cat, by the way. He's um, on my oh, on my way. Oh boy, your cat's on the way. No, Marty's on the way. Basil's uh, Basil's uh, limousining him here. If you could get a helicopter, Basil, if, if you're out there, if you could get a helicopter to get these folks in a little quicker, that'd be real helpful. We appreciated it. But um, so now we've got uh, the case of um, the six officers in um, in Baltimore that have been charged with various crimes. Did they ever, uh, I don't remember hearing what exactly Freddie Gray was initially charged with. Like I read in this. I believe he wasn't. That, well, no. Well, they said something to the effect of, they, uh, yeah, the arrest itself was illegal. They found there was no reason to detain him. Mm -hmm. um, she said the knife that police officers found on Gray was a, turned out to be legal. A pocket. So I guess, a little, yeah. A little Swiss Army knife. So I, like I said, I don't remember ever hearing any given arrest or any uh, thing from the officers that said, hey, we arrested him for X, Y, and Z. But, I yeah. mean, because that would be the first thing I would say, like, um, and I don't remember ever hearing, were there any 
uh, witnesses when he was arrested? Like, when he was placed into the van, yeah. were there any witnesses around at that Because I know the guy that filmed it, mm-hmm. if I remember right, is now being investigated by the police for something I heard. They probably, they're probably trying to discredit him, I'm mm-hmm. sure. But um, at any rate, uh, important to note, though, that um, you know, usually we think of police officers murdering black kids, and we think that they're white. In this case, of the six individuals that are being charged, the six individuals, the six police officers that were involved... You have um, three white males. You have a um, uh, man of, uh, whose family is, has an Asian background. You have a black woman and a black man. So, there's, so you're pretty much representative all the way around with, um, with these officers. So it's not your, your, your stereotypical white police officers murdering black guys. But I guess the point remains... Well, there you go. Black people are moving up to killing themselves, I guess. There you go. I guess, I guess maybe the, the, the point is that the homicide is homicide is homicide, and murder is murder is murder. And the folks that, uh, that are, are in that kid's family want to see everybody punished for what they did, oh, yeah. regardless of, of what their ethnic background or, or I mean, it, the woman... It, it, it can be a component, but I've never understood why we need to separate people... Uh, granted in mm. certain situations like that yeah. because if you've done something where you've caused a man to die yeah. it shouldn't matter if you're black, white, whatever granted, again, it could be a contributing factor if you're a racist white guy yeah. and you hate black people yeah. it can be a contributing factor of why you'd want to go kill a black guy but it shouldn't be oh, well now we've got these black people that are killing yeah. black people it's not just white people it, it, to me, it I granted, I understand why it's still here but I always think to myself, we're in 2015 at this point. Mm-hmm. We're not in the 60s or the 50s or the 1800s or whatever. And again, it, I'm not trying to say this as being naive, but we should have at this point in humanity moved past uh, either racism or and, and war in general. But regret, regrettably, it, I hate to say it, but it's probably always going to be a part of the human nature. Part, there you go, part of the human nature. There's always going to be... The way I look at life is that... Um, it's going to be a very small portion, but... Thank you, <laughs> our audience. Thank you, but... Um, I got you there, okay. <laughs> uh, the way I look at it is that, is that people are, are generally good. People aren't born bad. People are generally good. And two points. One is that people sometimes learn to do bad things... Well, what's that old saying? Hate has to be taught. Like, pretty much everybody, like, yeah. like little kids will play with anybody that they find. It doesn't matter if they're black, white, whatever. And then there have been times where I've read reports like, oh, we don't want little Johnny playing with little Tyrone or, or whatever yeah. because he's black or, sh- or she's black or, yeah. or what have you. And then the little girls or the little boys are like, well, I don't care. But it's the parents who have a problem with it, or yeah. they may not be adversely racist. Like they may not be like screaming epithets at the kid, but there may be some underlying thing that they were taught or their parents were taught at, that has some slight problems. So, like I said, they may not be like, like I said, screaming the N word at somebody. Yeah. But there's some underlying thing where they're saying, "Well, I don't really trust black people, or I don't really trust Mexican people, or." We're going we're gonna to come back in, in about three, four minutes. Uh, we're going to end the show up. But I want to get one very personal note in um, before we close this one down. Because Marty's on his way. I believe A.J. Johnson is already also on her way. So we're going to do a second show after we've done our warm-up program here. But um, I lived in Miami. My parents moved down there when I was a year old. And we came back when I was nine to Connecticut. And... Uh, one of the driving forces between, behind my mother wanting to get the heck out of Miami, Florida and get back is that she was in the car with me and, uh, and I was a little kid at the time and we drove through a part of Miami called uh, Liberty City. And Liberty City is um, a predominantly black area of Miami, Florida. It may still be. Thank you. Um, and my mom's driving through there and I'm in the passenger seat and um, I looked out the window and I said to my mom, God doesn't love those people. And apparently I'd learned that somewhere because I have, why would any kid come to the conclusion that people that look different than him would be anything other than just people? Well, my mom heard me say that. She told me years later, she said when she heard me say that, her immediate reaction was, we got to get the heck out of this place. 
because I don't want my son growing up to be a racist. I don't want my son to grow up having those kinds of attitudes toward people based on their skin color. Before we, before we close up on this show, um, bring us back to some other incidents that have been in the news lately. Um, the one about the, the guy was running away from the cop and the cop shot him in the back a number of times, and some of the other ones. Well, there, I did pull up the, uh, the death of uh, Kelly Thomas, mm-hmm. um, and he, uh, he was basically a schizophrenic... I don't know how much time we have, but he was basically Two. a schizophrenic man in, uh, in uh, uh, Southern California. I think it was mm-hmm. San, uh, San Francisco, but basically... Yeah. He, uh, his father was a retired cop, and basically there were some break-ins um, that were around in some cars. So the cops went and investigated, and they ended up finding him basically in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm-hmm. And he ended up, again, he was schizophrenic, he was mentally unstable. So I guess they, I don't know exactly what happened, but there's video basically of one cop with his knee on his throat. There's another cop, like, on top of him. He's screaming and crying for his father, uh, again, who was a retired cop of that force, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically, you just see horrible... Uh, I mean, I don't know if, uh, if I can pull up the picture. I don't know if you'd want to see it. There's but. actually... there's actually. We're going to break away in just one minute, but there's actually a... A uh, case of that fairly close to home in New Milford. Uh, I'm going to say it's been a while, about 15, 20 years. An officer named Scott Smith, who um, um, had a black man under custody and had his um, had his foot on the black man's back, so he couldn't get up. And I don't know what he was charged with, if anything. But the uh, the officer's story was, Officer Scott Smith's story was that he saw the man reach for a knife. And that's when the officer shot him in the back and killed there him. There is a, uh, a BuzzFeed video. It's something, I forget the exact title, but it's something the effect and was, of... And he was convicted, by the way. ...of uh, like how cops perceive black men or mm-hmm. black people. And there's been studies that show they perceive them as bigger than white people than they are. They see them as more violent than they are. We'll keep, we'll keep shooting as you continue. Go on. Continue. No, no, I was going to say, they, they basically perceive them like, if they see somebody who's like 5'7", mm-hmm. they may perceive him as 6'4". Yeah. Um, in the heat of the moment. And so, they may see something um, that's not there, but uh, if they see a white defendant, they'll see him as 5'7", yeah. or 5'8", or what have you. And I don't know if you want to see this, but I did pull up the picture of what they did to Kelly Thomas. That yeah, was at the hospital. Pretty gruesome, yeah. So, I mean, and I ended up showing it on one of my shows. I mean, it's it's horrific that things like that happen, and then that's the that's got to be the catalyst, apparently, to, to stopping police violence is, oh, this guy got killed, now we're going to do something. It should be, hey, this guy got killed 10 years ago or 15 years ago, let's yeah. do something then. Or let's, f- and granted, I understand people are. I think and maybe, we're and maybe the maybe the police vest. We we'll just keep on yeah. talking until. Um, I think people they are fighting.